Yeah, welcome to this presentation. We are going to look at the, the South Sudan health system. So such than as you already know, uh, it faces uh, a number of challenges. This is because of uh, its history and political context. Uh, so it means that we need to really understand the, the underlying social and economic factors that uh, drive uh, health outcomes in substance. Um, using the perspective of looking at uh, the health system. So, for if you're going to look at any health system, you need to first understand the, the history and the political context uh, of that given country. So, in South Sudan, we know that the, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, uh, which was signed, ended the, what we call the Sudanese Civil War, which lasted for 21 years. Uh, as a result of this agreement, uh, South Sudan got its independence from Sudan. And then uh, a few years later, uh, there was uh, a conflict to 13 and then to 16. So these conflicts uh, have resulted into breakdown of the health sector. Uh, many people have lost their lives. There have been displacements and the economic situation is dire. It's characterized with high rates of inflation. Geographically, South Sudan covers 650,000 square kilometers with uh, varied vegetation cover. Most of the people, uh, about 90%, rely on agriculture and livelihood uh, and livestock as their livelihoods. And uh, across the country, different rural areas, there is limited access to markets. And this makes than one of the countries that is least developed in the world. Access to education is still a challenge. We have uh, an illiteracy rate for women of 88% and women of 63%. Uh, Access to water is still a challenge. With uh, about 55% of the population having improved the access to water. And then access to proper sanitation of only 7% have access, and primary enrollment is still low, 18%. 0.8% for girls. Uh, and then uh, much of the land is used for, remember we said 90% of the people rely on agriculture and livestock, and 71% of the total land is what is available and suitable for agriculture and livestock.
So what are the health indicators in the country? Maternal mortality is one of the highest in the whole world, about 1,150 uh, uh, deaths per 100,000 live births. Okay, so we, we have the highest, one of the highest number of women dying because of pregnancy and child bearing uh, processes. Neonatal mortality is still also high, that is at 39.3 per, per, uh, per 1000 life births. And then under five mortality rates of 99.2 per 1000 life births. These are estimates. Um, we have a big burden for communicable diseases, but we also have non communicable diseases also affecting individuals, or they are on the rise. Okay, still, the emphasis is that maternal health outcomes are not good. And children under the age of five are suffering from acute malnutrition. We also have neglected tropical diseases such as the gene worm disease. Uh, we also have the cellular leishmaniasis. These are among the diseases that are happening uh, in different communities that there are no uh, a lot of focus to address or even eliminate these conditions. Tuberculosis and uh, HIV still uh, exist in the population. HIV prevalence is estimated to be at 2.6 percent. Common diseases for children under five include malaria, diarrhea, pneumonia. These actually form about 77 percent of the diagnoses that are made in the health facility. Like I said, uh, the least we have communicable disease leading, uh, but we also have non communicable conditions happening. Um, other health issues that are not given a lot of attention include mental health issues and also road traffic accidents. In order to address the problems, or in order to bring about improvement in the health indicators, uh, the National Ministry of Health has the 2016 to 2025 National Health Policy that tries to identify the major health problems and address them. Emphasis is put on uh, addressing major health issues and their determinants, and then also improving the service organization infrastructure in order to achieve universal health coverage. And then uh, making sure that we have intersectoral collaboration involving different sectors communities, families, and also individuals. And then building the capacity of training institutions to be able to uh, produce uh, competent health workers. And then also uh, 
uh, laying a foundation for long-term planning and strategic partnerships of efficient resource use and better outcomes. So let's look at the governance structures in the health sector in South Sudan. Okay, governance is one of the building blocks of the health system. Uh, it encompasses uh, government procedures in uh, policy formulation, implementation, and offering stewardship to achieving improved health outcomes and efficient resource utilization. Governance can be looked at at national and local levels. These are very important. Okay. Governance at national and local levels are very important. It is very important that decisions are made from bottom uh, and then uh, implementation and resource allocation can happen at the higher levels of top governance structures. So the Minister of Health is the one who is responsible for steering the national health agenda or sector in the country. The minister is appointed by the president and can be sacked by the president. And the minister acts as the political head of the ministry. The undersecretary acts as the, the technical head of the ministry and supervises the different directorates. Under the Ministry of Health, we have the Directorate of Administration and Finance, Directorate of Preventive Medicine, Director of Primary Health Care, Director of HIV and AIDS, Stroke, AIDS Control, Director of Intuitive Medicine, Director of Planning, HR, HR Department, Development, and then the Chairman of uh, Medical Commission. Okay? So, under the different directorates, we have uh, in, we have the director generals in the different directorates and then uh, the deputy directors of different sub uh, or different departments in the Ministry of Health. So you have not been seeing my screen, right? All right, so the Minister of Health is responsible for uh, making uh, policies, improving the human resource capacity, Health financing, health care regulation, and also uh, interministerial coordination. Basically, the Ministry of Health provides leadership and governance to be able to push uh, the national health agenda. Okay, so at different levels, we have uh, 
uh, uh, below the, the, the National Ministry of Health, we also have the State Ministry of Health, and then also the county uh, level health structures that are very important in managing uh, state and also county health activities. The challenge in coordination of these organizational structures is that there is lack of sufficient internet penetration telecom connections in most states. And this makes it very difficult to have coordinated communication. At the state level, the Ministry of Health is concerned, the State Ministry of Health is concerned with conducting joint assessments, planning and implementation of healthcare services. Therefore, it provides leadership, sectoral coordination, and supervision, also referral management. Then you also have what you call the county health departments, which we call the CHDs, which are also responsible for coordination, local planning, and implementation of healthcare services. They also provide supervision, uh, guidance, and conducting epidemiological surveillance. Okay, this community health care centers implement what we call the basic package of health services uh, that encourage community participation. The community participates uh, in using this approach. This approach is similar, it's basically a primary health care package. Uh, in our health system. The community participation is very key to ensure sustainability. Okay, so establishment of referral systems and what, making weekly work plans are some of the roles that are performed at the county health departments. So generally, what we have is that we have the National Ministry of Health and then under the National Ministry of Health we have the State Ministry of Health and then down we come to the county, uh, the county health departments and the county hospitals and then Below that, you have the primary health care centers and primary health care units. And then there is a connection through the community uh, health initiatives. The Boma Health Initiative, you have community members who are being chosen to help um, in engaging in selected health activities at the village or community level. The money that the Minister of Health uses comes from a number of sources. Uh, the revenues that are collected um, under the Ministry of Finance with the Ministry of Finance, which grows the budget. The Ministry of Health has to convince the Ministry of Finance on the budgetary allocations needed to finance health services in a given financial year. Then we also have the multi donor Trust Fund, uh, multilateral donors with different 
donor mechanisms to finance health in South Sudan. The challenge is that it is very hard to have accountability and transparency in the, in the financing of the health system in the country because of lack of robust uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the lack of uh, a tracking system makes it very difficult to have uh, uh, transparency in the use of resources. Uh, so this is where you have corruption taking place uh, because of lack of uh, financial accountability mechanisms. Um, the citizens can get services uh, from primary health care units and centers uh, at free, these are services provided by the government. But sometimes the citizens also make what we call out of pocket payments. Because sometimes there are no drugs, sometimes they need to go to a private pharmacy to buy the drug, or even go to a private laboratory to perform a particular, uh, a particular test. We also have the NGO sector providing health services, but this often results into uh, higher unit costs, and therefore the resources are not efficiently used uh, in the NGO sector. So the Ministry of Health comes up with a budget and then it takes to the legislature together with the Ministry of Finance and that budget will be approved. Usually the budget has been between 2 to 8 percent of the national budget. This is below uh, what is recommended to be spent on the health sector. The Abuja Declaration suggests that 15% of the national budget is spent on health. The State Ministry of Health receives the funds through the National Ministry of Health transfers. So it is the National Ministry of Health that transfers the funds to the State Ministry of Health. But across the board from the national ministry to the state ministries, still there is need to, to establish robust financial systems that can minimize inefficiencies in expenditure and also issues to do with uh, misappropriation. So usually, the budget comes from uh, the lower governance levels in what we call the bottom-up budgeting process. So the 
the county health departments. have uh, their budgetary uh, estimations that they sent to the National Ministry of Health. And then the National Ministry of Health now comes up with a budget and then seeks or, or advises the Ministry of Finance on how much is needed and then finally that budget is discussed in the national legislature. If approved, the National Ministry of Finance can now perform the transfer. The money is transferred now to, uh, to the different states. Okay? But often there are delays that happened because much of the budget is financed by revenues from the oil resources. And if the revenues from oil resources take long to come, then it means that uh, then it means that also the transfers to the different states will also delay. Out-of-pocket expenditures are very common even when you go to government institutions. Uh, even when the basic healthcare services are supposed to be for free to all citizens. Uh, out-of-pocket payments continue to, to be common. Bribes to health workers who are not paid for longer periods of time solicit for money from patients. Okay, the health workers solicit money from patients and this actually also constitutes to what we call out-of-pocket payments or expenditures. And sometimes if it is not the payments to the health workers, it is uh, money that has to be spent to buy uh, supplies. It could be gloves, could be drugs, it could be money that is required to, uh, to perform some tests. So I was off, but now I'm back. Uh, let's just continue from where we ended. So it is very common that payments have to 
be made in our health facilities, whether it is state hospitals, whether it is at uh, primary health care centers or primary health care units. Uh, so let us look at the human resources for health in the country. It is very important that we have uh, well-motivated, competent health workers uh, working in the country. Uh, it is very important that uh, we have very good human resource management practices and policies. This has uh, a contribution it makes to ensuring that uh, we have adequate human resources for health in every place. But also it plays an important role in retaining health workers, in motivating them, and also upgrading their knowledge and skills. At the moment, we have very few uh, qualified human resources for health. Some have left the country and others have gone to, for further studies in neighboring countries. Okay, uh, we don't have specialist training programs uh, in the country at the highest level. And also those who are specialists, uh, the ability to attract and also retain them is, uh, is limited because of issues to do with payments and uh, the general working environment that plays a very big role. So who does the human resource planning? It is of course the National Ministry of Health. It's the one which addresses the human resource problems. But still, uh, we, the country lacks a robust human resource information system. We need to know how many people are working with the National Ministry of Health and also working with the government generally in the health sector. We need to know this, the people who are on the payroll, uh, how much are they receiving, and whether they are receiving it regularly, do we have avenues of uh, career development? These things are very important. But if you lack the human resources information system, it becomes very difficult. We hope that with time, we shall have that system in place. Payment of staffs is one of the challenges that we have. Uh, the staff are irregularly paid and they are also not receiving enough, the payments are little. So this contributes to demotivation and uh, they often look for better compensation uh, in the, uh, the, the non-governmental organizations. Okay, so they off, the non-government organizations actually offer uh, more incentives and also uh, avenues for professional development uh, available. We also still have a major problem of uh, the fact that most of the or most of the workforce have been minimally trained. Uh, that is training that is less than one year uh, in an accredited institution. Okay. Um, because of this lack of information, it is hard to tell who has what qualification and where did they get that qualification from. 
those are some of the challenges that the sector continues to to experience. I think my internet is on and off, but definitely I hope we'll just continue uh, such that uh, we finish this presentation. Okay. So the, the health workers that we have um, have not been trained uh, for considerable period of time. Only 40% have been trained uh, or have training that has lasted for uh, at least uh, one year. Okay, so that is a, a big challenge. So it is very important that we utilize what we call experiential learning, improving the skills of the health workers. Uh, we have a number of institutions providing training for health professionals in the country. We have the health training institutes uh, uh, under the Ministry of Health. And then we also have government uh, universities training doctors, nurses, and other health professionals, like pharmacists and public health. Service delivery um, has deteriorated because of the war and also lack of financial resources has hampered the service delivery in the, across the country. The NGOs and the faith-based organizations are trying to play a very important role, but of course uh, there are limitations uh, in this uh, delivery of health services. Most of the services are actually provided by either NGOs or faith-based organizations. Most of the primary health care centers, primary health care units, are managed by non government organizations. Having a robust health system is very important for you to know the health status of the population and also use it to, for planning purposes. Um, we still lack the sufficient capacity to, 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 to have a robust national-wide health information management system. One of the issues is that we have not um, invested in training uh, data managers. We need health information professionals to be able to uh, manage these systems in the different, uh, different states. Data is very important because it allows proper planning and uh, improves health outcomes in life. Another aspect that we can discuss is whether every community or every uh, geographical area, tribe, whatever committee you think about, has access to healthcare in the country. That is an issue of equity. We still have areas that don't have access to healthcare services because of 
either insecurity or geographical accessibility issues. So it is very important to identify these communities and be able to design interventions to improve the health of underserved groups. Uh, quality improvement is very important. You need to have standardized the tools to be able to measure the quality of services provided in different health facilities. Different health facilities are supposed to be having quality assurance committees to be able to evaluate the quality of services provided in a health center or health facility. And also sometimes perform uh, what we call performance-based service delivery uh, appraisals to be able to improve quality and access to health services. The other aspect that is actually very important is investing in health promotion. This requires that we have adequate health information and know the behaviors that influence health. And then we can be able to train and deploy community health workers to deliver health services and health messages that can raise awareness about uh, high impact services like immunization, uh, uh, treated mosquito nets, and about nutrition. Like I said, health information system is very important at all levels uh, for decision making and proper planning. Okay? The issue that we have is that every organization is utilizing its own health information system. And then this is what we call fragmentation and verticality. So people are having parallel operating systems on health information. And that, that makes it very difficult to collect and utilize and even disseminate data. That is very, that is uh, in, the data that is actually very important in our service delivery. NGOs have tried, but still uh, there are gaps in fragmentation, like I've said. Most organizations are running their own health information systems. Uh, though there are those that try to collect and transmit the data to the government, the government facilities may not lack, may, may, may lack the trained personnel to manage this data and the different levels of the health system. At the county level, still it is very important that valid and reliable data is kept. However, issues of lack of personnel and lack of proper data collection procedures and protocols and lack of training and high staff turnover. This makes it very difficult to have high quality data at the county level. So it's one of the challenges of health information systems in the country. Now we look at the pharmaceutical and health community management. We, in this area, we look at how drugs are procured, how drugs are procured, how they are kept, and how they are distributed. Of course, the National Ministry of Health uh, is the one that oversees this. Uh, there are very many mechanisms for procuring drugs into South Sudan. Uh, because drugs of or pharmaceuticals can come 
into the country when they are brought by or imported by private uh, 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 private sector uh, actors or NGOs uh, or NGOs and then also the government itself or even the non-profit I mean the faith-based organizations can import drugs into the country. Okay, so there are several mechanisms. Um, it is very important that the government ensures that we have access to what we call essential drugs. Essential drugs are those that are used to treat the most prevalent uh, conditions in the population. And they are usually given to the citizens for free. However, because of the issues to do with the slow procurement distribution, there are always issues to do with stockouts. So we have stock shortages. Um, some states have devised ways of countering this problem by establishing funds to make sure that they can purchase medical and pharmaceutical supplies on their own. Uh, so, in most cases, the patients will have to go to health facilities that are managed by NGOs in order for them to get the drugs that they need if there are stockouts in government facilities. But we also have what we call informal drug vendors uh, or the drug shops where the patients can go and buy the drugs they need. So it is very important that we have an efficient procurement system to make sure that drugs can reach patients in a timely manner. The drugs that are bought should be those that meet the needs of the population. It is very important to move away from what we call the push system, where the ministry, the one that orders the drugs to be used by the different states. It's important that the information about what drugs should be bought comes from the lower levels. That's what you call the pool system. So the facilities should be able to place the orders and control the flow of those drugs that they have ordered. The challenge, of course, still related to the data management systems there is still low capacity to use those systems to be able to forecast the needs. The distribution of the drugs is also another issue because uh, of poor road networks and also insecurity. Having qualified staff to manage pharmaceutical products is very key. Uh, and there is therefore need to improve on that. So if we don't pre uh, forecast what you intend to have and use in a given period of time, this will affect the delivery of healthcare services because there will be stockouts and this will affect the quality of service delivered. If the transportation, that is the distribution, is not done in the right way, you can have pharmaceutical products reaching uh, the best nations when they are damaged. And this causes issues to do with wastage. If you have chronic shortage of drugs, uh, this will influence health-seeking behavior of the 
populations you're serving. So it is very important that uh, you have strong mechanisms to control and also coordinate the, uh, the flow of supplies. So in order to strengthen the health system, a number of things uh, have to be done. Okay? Uh, training human resources, making sure that you have a proper remuneration uh, structure, training uh, staffs, having uh, uh, robust information systems, uh, also um, improving on the pharmaceutical management, and then Okay, that marks the end of our slides. Thank you.